So in the last video, we talked about Fermi Dirac statistics and the Fermi probability function, f of e. And I've been promising you that at some point we're going to be able to calculate the total number of electrons, n, in the semiconductor. And indeed, we're almost there. So we've got the probability distribution function. We've got the density of states function. And all that remains is to figure out from what energies to what energies uh, do we need to carry out this integration? And in order to find those energies, we're going to use what's called the band model of semiconductors. Now this model is probably the single most important model that's been developed for semiconductors. And if you understand it really well, you can understand a lot of really difficult to grasp grasp phenomena. Uh, so we're going to spend a lot of time on it over the course of the these videos, and this is just going to be a brief introduction to it. So to get to the band model of semiconductors, we're going to start with high school chemistry, and we're going to start with the Bond model, James Bond. So if we've got a bunch of silicon atoms, uh, we know that each one has four electrons. So each silicon atom has four free uh, electrons when it's not uh, when it doesn't exist in anything and we know if you put that next to other silicon atoms that these two silicon atoms will share their electrons and form double bonds so silicon atoms are bonded to their neighbors via these double bonds and I'm no longer drawing the uh, electrons I'm instead just drawing the the atoms themselves and the bonds but the idea is that each, each atom starts out with four electrons uh, that it can share with its neighbors. So we've got all of our silicon atoms. Now at T equals zero degrees Kelvin, this picture is accurate. So every silicon atom is bonded to every other silicon atom that's adjacent to it. But as we start to increase the temperature, uh, these silicon atoms start to vibrate to the left, they start to vibrate to the right, so the bonds get stretched and, and strained. And so at some point, uh, the bonds are going to have enough energy, if you, prefer, if you like, uh, that one of them is going to break. So at some point, one of these bonds is going to break, and this electron is going to be freed. So this electron is now just free to move around as it pleases in the silicon lattice. And we can translate this into a, the band model of the electron or the band model of semiconductors and saying that initially at T equals zero Kelvin, all the electrons are below a certain energy. So they're all below what we call the valence band energy. They're all in the valence band. And the reason we call it the valence band is just because silicon's valence atoms are its outermost, or its valence electrons are its outermost electrons that participate in bonding and that are responsible for all of its chemical properties, et cetera, et cetera. So the valence band is when the electrons uh, don't have enough energy to escape. Now, as you start to increase the temperature and electrons start to escape, we say that they are excited into the conduction band, EC. And we call it the conduction band just because once the electron is freed from its bond, it can move around and it can conduct electricity in the conduction band. And so once the electron is freed, we've got an electron up here and it's free to move around. So if you apply an electric field to the left, the electron is going to move to the right uh, because it's, uh, it's got a negative charge. And if you apply an electric field to the right, the electron is free to move to the left. And so this, this electron is free to move. However, if you apply an electric field to any of these electrons, any of these bound electrons, none of them will move. So the bonds might get distorted a little bit, but these guys are not free to move. And so we say that electrons in the valence band or electrons that are still bound to other atoms uh, are not free to conduct electricity. They are not charge carriers. They do not contribute 
to the total amount of charge that's free to move around in the semiconductor. Now we talked about the electron after it moves up, but what about the thing that it leaves behind? So we know if we break one of these bonds in our, in our simple bond model, we know once the electron leaves, it leaves behind this positive charge. So this positive char charge is shared across these two silicon atoms, but it's where an electron used to be and an electron is no longer. Um, and this we call a hole, uh, which is a rather obvious name because once the electron leaves, it leaves a hole or a vacancy. And uh, other electrons nearby are free to fill that vacancy. So I can take this bond, this bond electron and move and occupy this hole. And then this bond will reform. Let me just redraw that. So this electron will cause this bond to reform. And this bond will be broken. And then the hole uh, will essentially have moved to its next door, its next door neighbor's apartment. Uh, so the electrons can fill holes. And you can equivalently say, well, uh, what if I didn't know that there was an electron there? What if it's actually the hole that's moving instead of the electron? What if we treated the hole like a particle itself? And the reason we want to do this is because mathematically speaking, it's much easier to keep track of a single particle than it is to keep track of all the particles around it uh, that might possibly become uh, come in to fill this vacancy. So we we always treat holes as if they are particles themselves, as if they are kind of like positively charged electrons. And we can draw an analogy with water. So if we've got this uh, container of water and say we've got fish moving around and in cartoons, uh, fish always make bubbles. Not sure why, because that's uh, pretty sure that's not how their respiration works. But the these bubbles inside water are nothing but empty space. They're not entities in and of themselves, but it would be so inconvenient to treat these bubbles as if they're just empty space and then worry about all the water around them that comes in to fill uh, the bubble. That would just be really inconvenient to model. It, no, one would, no one would talk that way. Uh, it's just not how... Uh, it's just not how you describe something that's so obviously uh, a particle in and of its own right. So a hole uh, is nothing but a bubble. There, uh, a hole is formed in the silicon lattice, a bubble is formed in water. It's just a way of keeping track of an empty state uh, that makes our life much, much easier. And the the nice part about holes is it turns out that you can treat them exactly like you treat electrons. It's just that they have a positive charge. So mathematically speaking, they're incredibly convenient. Conceptually, they're just like a bubble. Uh, they're much more convenient than representing all of the electrons around them. So we always talk about holes and electrons. So when one electron breaks its bond, and moves into the conduction band to sort of move around as it pleases. So it can move here, it can move here, it can move anywhere it wants. Uh, that electron in the conduction band leaves, which is free to move now in the conduction band, leaves behind a hole that is free to move in the valence band. So if I apply an electric field, the hole is going to move to the left. Uh, if, I apply, if I apply an electric field in the other direction to the right, the hole is going to move to the right. So this concept of the whole is going to come up again and again, and uh, it's important to really understand what it means. So I've, I've sort of described it briefly here, uh, but holes in the valence band are just like electrons in the conduction band. So all the other electrons in the valence band aren't free to move around. They're sort of constrained, uh, whereas the holes can move however they wish. So the charge carriers, uh, this, this verbiage that I've been using up to this point almost without justification, 
are electrons and holes. These are the two uh, elementary particles that are responsible for conduction in solids. And we'll see that holes really can be treated as if they were particles uh, in, the next, in the next couple videos on, uh, on energy momentum diagrams. So I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, I'll see you next time.